Hello and welcome to A Review to a Kill, the James Bond retrospective podcast where we rewatch every Bond from Connery to Craig to review and rank each one. I'm your host, Agent Double Negative Matthew Sedgwick, and joining me for the debrief is an agent still rumored undefeated as Odd Job in Goldeneye. Ah, oh, fuck, I missed my cue. Carter, Chris Carter. <laughs> <laughs> His one cue. I was His listening. I was just, I was totally listening. I'm sorry. Fuck. <laughs> and he missed it. I love it. We're starting off great, boys. Yeah. Today we are reviewing uh, Dr. No, the first offering from Eon Productions, released on October 5th of 1962. So 60 years old this year. This is the 60th anniversary of Bond 60th in the UK. 60th anniversary of Bond. Bond was released almost 10 years before I was born. Um, he's and, dating himself yeah well you know i'm old <laughs> i'm old and as an old guy i can appreciate some bond i'll tell you what i've seen every james bond movie um i didn't see the earlier ones we'll get we'll, we'll, get, to, we'll get to the uh our accreditations in a second i just want to say it yeah. was released on may 8th 1963 in the united states so we did have to wait a while on this side of the pond produced by broccoli and saltzman directed by terrence young and starring some guy named sean connery it was made for a budget of $1.1 million and made, how much do you think it made in, in the box office? Uh, I would say uh, in the 60s, probably in the neighborhood of $7 million, $8 million. Oh, $59.5 million off a $1 million budget. Holy crap, this movie was in a smash! In 1962. <laughs> There's a reason <laughs> they started shelling these out. <laughs> This movie was a total smash. Oh my god, that's like a Spider-Man in today's money. Let's go. Let's go into our accreditations. Let's open the the dossier on Agent Carter. Uh, you say you've been watching Bond since Bond has been Bond almost. Yeah, pretty much. I, well, where I grew up was uh, culturally behind the rest of the United States, even though I was born in the United States, Mississippi. Yeah, not Mississippi. I got a lot of a lot of exposure to Bond early on because, you know, it was older and, you know, it was what was on television at the time. I didn't really get to see my first Bond movie in the theater until much, much later. What Bond movie was that? I I want to say Moonraker. Ooh, okay, okay. Which is one of my, I, like, I, a lot of people are going to hate us, of course, for some of our opinions, but I actually love Moonraker. It's like a guilty pleasure of mine. I've been watching Bond for well over 30 years. Honestly, I'm 37, and as long as I can remember, I've been watching my dad's films. And then I got them all on VHS for Christmas, and I would go to sleep to a different one every night. I've, people say I've seen this movie over 100 times. I've literally seen all of them well over 100 times. Then I got them all on DVD, so on and so forth. We've known each other for about 10 years, and we've been critiquing movies and, and had a, a few different shows. And we've decided to put our love of James Bond together. And come up with a uh, comprehensive rankings list for James Bond. Now, yeah. not only is it a co going to be a comprehensive ranking list, but it's going to be a quite controversial, I feel, rankings list. Because we watch movies with more of a, a critical eye, I have to say. An analytical eye, yeah. And that's here lately, you know. I've, as I've gotten older, I've just learned to appreciate my movies more for what they're worth. Like a nice meal. Yeah, like a nice meal. I don't have to say I enjoy eating shit just because it sustains me. Right. <laughs> That's true. But we wanted to go over this. We've done plenty of shows uh, and things like that. We have a lot of interest in James Bond. There's a lot of James Bond 10-minute review shows on YouTube. And there's a lot of reviews where people are really big fans of the show. And there seems to be some reviews from people who are really good at critique. But there doesn't seem to be any shows where there's like that, that middle of the Venn diagram where like they, they are really big super fans and also really good at movie critique. And I kind of wanted to blend that in together, humbly I might say. Humbly I might say. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I have not taken any professional classes in critique, but I have been watching movies all my life, so I've picked up a thing or two. Well, let's get this started. We've broken down this retrospective by way of, you know, different sections iconic bond tropes moments uh things like that but also in a way that we kind of can go over the course of the movie at the same time uh, as we say we're starting with the beginning here dr no and the first gun barrel sequence because well, where are you going to start with a james bond movie if not the gun barrel sequence 
Well, we can uh, we can definitely start with the gun barrel sequence, but there is always an opening sequence pre gun barrel sequence, right? There's always no, 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 uh, not until Craig. The gun barrel sequence happens before the pre title sequence. Uh, it wasn't until Craig came and they got all artsy with it. Yeah, I it seems and incorporated that until the end of the uh, maybe, pre-title maybe. sequence. We'll be watching them all again, so. I could, yeah, yeah, we'll be watching them all again. This sequence is credited to Maurice Bender, the uh, famous title designer who created the openings, mm-hmm. uh, the opening titles uh, for this film. Oh, for, he did them for 14 different Bond films, though. When I was looking this up, it's nuts. This guy's prolific. Nice, nice. Well, he's he, he's the one who set the bar. I mean, every Bond movie yeah. has been pretty much in that vein. In, in that style, yeah. absolutely. Imitation is the highest form of flattery. Uh well I mean you set you like you said you set the bar you set the look like it's that's what Bond is. Mm-hmm. Uh the look of this sequence was actually achieved with a pinhole camera shooting through a real gun barrel. Really? Did you know that? I did not yeah, know the that. first one. The first one. I did I did ours with like shapes in Adobe Photoshop. This guy just was like, nah, gun barrel. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, <laughs> they didn't have Adobe Photoshop back then, so you know, to what? get that shot. Well, I we're gonna get into special effects, but I don't want to know how they did these shots without Adobe After Effects. Yeah, yeah, they're, uh, well, let's just say cinematographers were really creative back in the day, and it shows now. (laughs) Imitation breeds innovation. That's true. Because the sequence was designed to feature Bond and silhouette in a non-widescreen aspect ratio, he is just like, screw it, I'm going to use Bob Simmons, the stunt guy, rather than Sean Connery, because, like, they'd probably have to, like, Get him back down for another day, pay him. Well, yeah, they'd have to pay him to film it, and he's just standing there in silhouette. You don't need this movie was made for a million dollars. They were not trying to spend on that, and Connery wasn't really that big. Hey, you know, in retrospect, Mister Universe did a Disney movie. No one knew of. Yeah, in retrospect, made for a million bucks. I mean, I've seen movies that were made for a million bucks. None of them were this good. What about Roger Corman's 1994 Fantastic Four? Well, that's the one I was thinking of. That was a million bucks. Yeah. yeah. And that, <laughs> and that was, was horrible. That movie is amazing. <laughs> you and I have different opinions well, on okay. that movie. It, it is amazing on a level, but it's not good. <laughs> it's amazingly terrible. Yes. Yes. It's terribly amazing. It just, it's so, it's a circle. It's a full circle. It's just amazing. It is. It is. So, uh, in, the, in this uh, opening sequence, uh, we digress. Uh, Simmons mm-hmm. is wearing a hat. And he hops slightly as he pivots to assume the firing position. Yeah. Both of these things I point out because both of these things have always fucking bothered me. <laughs> I, can, I can understand that. That little hop in the pivot. It's like, what are you doing, aerobics? What, oh, what is that, man. jumping jacks? Okay. I like... Well, it's better than what Lazenby does. And I'm sure you're going to hate me for saying that. But we'll get into that in a few movies. Yeah, we'll get into that in a few movies. <laughs> and when you see it, you're going to know. He kind of like pivots down onto a knee and throws a hand out like hey yeah he's he, i no i distinctly remember jazz hands he, like i can't <laughs> understand why he did that but you know that's what he did dude he went for it man it doesn't in my opinion completely detract from the movie but we're not talking about that one we're talking about this one. <laughs> we're not we're not there we're not there no we're talking about the first one dr no like this is the first bond movie and after watching this movie i realized that all of the tropes for all of the Bond movies were set in this first fucking movie. Damn near. If not this one, by the time, um, I mean, a, a lot of them in, in um, From Russia With Love and the last few in GoldenEye, the last couple, like it, it, by, the, by the time the third movie's out, like everything that is Bond has already been laid on the table. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, definitely by the third movie. But, you know, I was watching this one closely, you know, critically. It, almost all of them are in there. Like, almost every Bond trope is in this movie. Like, they may not Mm -hmm. be in the following movies, but all of them are in this one. I like this Bond, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. I don't want to get far ahead of myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I really, I don't want to, uh, but I really like this Bond for his vulnerability and his humanity. Almost kind of like John McClane in the first Die Hard compared to all the others before he became, like, superhero. Before Bond was too cool, too cold, too, like badass just a human dude with no he gets scared even yeah it's it's a yeah in this movie it's just a person james bond is it well it's reminiscent of the daniel craig era without all of the without all of the stunts 
but yeah. The pre-title sequence is uh, the next usual thing that happens in a James Bond movie. But if you remember correctly, there's not one in this one. No, there <laughs> is no pre-title sequence in this one. The uh, the dot that goes down from the gun barrel sequence, instead of revealing the opening sequence, reveals just goes to the jazz dots and the uh, the James Bond theme. So if you want to count the pre-title sequence for this movie, if you want to count what it would be, it would be the Shrangways murder and the introduction of Bond at the casino. Mm -hmm. Shrangways is um, a British information gatherer of some kind. He's an agent. Down in uh, Jamaica. He's, he breaks off playing cards with his mates at, uh, to call into home office. Mm -hmm. It's some secret agent check-in. It's just to like make sure he's alive and all that kind right, of stuff. Right. But then, bam, the three blind mice, these uh, assassins who pretend to be blind dudes, coming through town the entire song. Mm -hmm. they're, they're there for, yeah, for the entire they, song. They shoot him in the back as he heads for his 1960 Ford Anguilla. Yeah. And they're surprise assassins. They're not actually blind. And after shooting him in the back, this is so dope, dude. Their getaway driver is driving a 1939 LaSalle funeral coach. It's, yes, it's a 1939 hearse. And they just kind of... You get caught driving that through town, and it's like, of course there's a body yeah, in the right, back. Right, of course. I, I mean, it's pretty fucking smart, I gotta say. They shove his body in, and the driver looks around all sus. He's like, hurry, man, hurry. Like, no fucking shit, dude. No, no, I'm gonna take my time shoving this body in just because you're impatient. <laughs> it's right. Like, it's just one of those lines that just didn't need to be in there, but they put it in there for some reason. Uh, I noticed there were a few cheesy lines in this. One of Shrangway's mates from the bridge game, Professor Dent, is played by Anthony Dawson. And this guy, Professor Dent, we're going to see a lot of throughout the movie. He looks odd and irritable when Shrangway was leaving the card game. He literally, like, noticeably, like, looks irritable and anxious and, like, looking at his watch and kind of like he's looking around all sus and stuff. Yeah, well... He already knows what's up. I mean, obviously. He knows what's up, but we don't know that yet. Right. We don't know that yeah. yet. We just see him looking around all sus. Uh, this uh, Dawson, Anthony Dawson, would actually go on to play Blofeld in From Russia with Love, the next film, and in Thunderball. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, because they don't show his head. They just right. have a guy stroking a cat. Right. It's so it's the same. Guy, it's Professor that guy, Dick. huh? Uh, yeah. I always wondered yeah, where no, Blofeld no. was. Uh, it's this guy. Uh, so then the assassins go to Shrangways. They spot and kill his secretary through the power of bad edits. And I'm like, seriously, bad edits. They cut, they break a window, and then they start shooting again because of limitations at the time. But everyone is so far off the mark when they do the cut that it's almost like they didn't even try. <laughs> yeah, it's so it, was, bad. it was kind of bad. I have to, I'm not going to disagree with you on that. It was, uh, well, it, just, they're so far off the mark. But you got to remember, <laughs> like, like could have put some tape down. You got to think about the time, Matthew. Like, people didn't really notice that kind of shit in the '60s. I did. <laughs> well, yeah, but you weren't around then, so of course you noticed. People had it more together by that time. I mean, you were going to see some stuff in the next, I would say, six, seven movies that you probably would not. And did not notice the first time you watched these movies. Because... Oh, yeah, I, d I definitely will admit. Like, I've seen these so many times. And I was telling my girlfriend that, that it's crazy. That I still, like, watching them as close as I do to write these notes. I definitely noticed some stuff that I still never noticed. Right. But, um... Still on this pre-title sequence, which I do want to remind you guys, is actually after the musical number that we haven't talked about yet. Just because normally this would become before it. Right. They transition to the London Club de Circle. This is a slow reveal of Bond focusing on setting and other players and the events that's going around him. It's setting a tone and stage. It's an incredible buildup. It really, really kind of like paints the character before it even shows him to you. Everything that's going on is just dripping like fancy and cool, especially for the time. Especially for the time. I mean, <clears throat> back then, the movies like, this James Bond's Dr. No in like Flint with Lee Marvin. These guys were the epitome of cool, right? They were <laughs> they were what every guy wanted to be. I mean, that was like one of the tropes. That's where that comes from. You know, women want him, men want to be him. It's literally where Austin Powers came from. Yeah, right. That's literally where Austin Powers came from. I mean Because Mike Myers still wanted to be him. <laughs> right? Yeah, so, yeah, these guys were ultra cool. Ultra cool. As it shows Bond's face for the first time, he's lighting a cigarette and saying his famous Bond, James Bond line, you know, but, like, 
first off, the way he's lighting the cigarette and just looking over with his eyes barely, I could barely give a fuck to raise him. Like, it's so fucking cool. <laughs> I don't believe, and I don't know, I could be getting this from the book or an interview or something. I don't believe that the scene originally was supposed to be the way it was, right? Because mm -mm. Trench says, uh, I'm Trench, Sylvia Trench. No, nobody introduces themselves like that. So James Bond comes up with a quick and witty retort of uh, Bond, James Bond. And, you yep. know, it's more of, it's more sarcasm directed towards her. Like, yeah, more of a Well, that's the way mocking. he did it here. Yeah. Well, that's that. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way he did it. I even have it in my notes. I was like, the line makes so much more sense here before it became a trope, before it became a line, because he, he literally. Uh, I mean, he looked at her miss, funny. <laughs> he he asks her miss and she goes trench Celia trench and then and it's like you're right like who says it like that so when she goes I admire your luck Mister and he goes Bond James Bond just shooting it right back at her the exact way right. no that was exactly why he did that this introduction of Bond is so fucking cool dude oh yeah and Sylvia oh, yeah. Trench is almost just as badass but in a different way like you get to know this girl she's played by Eunice Gason by the way Gason is one of the few actresses to appear in multiple Bond films and until the Craig era the only girl to play the same character in back-to-back -back Bond films she comes back for an early sequence in Russia with Love she's on a picnic with Bond he must have liked that he must have liked that that's all I'm gonna say Sylvia Trench is suave. She's cool. She doesn't have muscles and guns, but she's very used to like running the power of her own circles. You can tell by the way she like talks to people, holds herself in this card game, the way she lets herself into his apartment, like the way she uses sexuality as her gun. Like she's just really badass in her own way. Well, that's because she's, I don't, well, I, I don't want to say like an assassin for hire or anything like that, but she already knows what's up. She's already, you know, She's already a villain, so... What? Sylvia Trench? No. Well... She's just a girl, and she even had a picnic with him later. Isn't she the one who invited her to the house and set him up? Oh. No, 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 no. That wasn't no. Sylvia Trench? No, 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 no. That was a different woman down in Jamaica. Oh, that's right. That's right. Different woman, different town. Mm-hmm. Different country. Mm -hmm. Different right. continent. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's fine. So we move on to the title sequence and theme song, which, once again, actually has already happened. But uh, it's Dots. There you go. That's your title sequence. It's fucking Dots. <laughs> Dot? <laughs> like James Bond, by the way, oddly, these Dots will return, <laughs> too. <laughs> like, for some reason, we keep paying homage to these fucking Dots. Yes. Well, I don't know. They liked Dots back in the... In the 60s, Polka Dot was hot. So... <laughs> So it was. There you have it. It was. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna front. Mini shirts or mini skirts and polka dots. In uh, future right. retro, whatever that and meant. Future retro. What's the vibe you got from this title sequence? By the way, once the dots were over, anyway. Um. Well, I didn't get much of a vibe because it wasn't much of a title sequence. You want to I mean, know what I got? Like, straight into the movie. It's like my notes for the title no, sequence no. say short. Was it the shortest? <laughs> like, yes. Yes, it might, it's probably the shortest title sequence. <laughs> like, Damn. Uh, That's um, fucking funny. I got iTunes commercial and blind dudes with canes. It's literally, at first, it's like a silhouetted girl with a colored background, and she's dancing like crazy to the Calypso. Yeah. And it's just like, and there's blind dudes with canes. And there's blind dudes with canes. I get what they were doing. They, they were, <laughs> they they were the doing... Nuts. Doing the sil the silhouette in the polka dot thing. It's it's. I don't want to say it's typical Bond because it's the first one, so it's there's nothing typical about it. It's just that that's what it's set up for all the other Bond movies later. It's and so different. It is. I I I don't know. The cinematographer was just trying to be different than the other movies that were out there. Other title sequences were. Other movies didn't even really have title sequences. Like let's be real. Like other movies, you know, you got the title and then you were in the movie and that well, was it. Well, were they endless credits of names painted on glass with fake clouds behind them that just kept going for like 20 minutes? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, they were not good. Yeah. So hands down, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to watch a few other movies from that era and era, but 
it was going for kind of a mod feel at the time and still be hip and trendy yet still weighty and serious if that could be a thing <laughs> so yeah kudos mission accomplished i suppose the original Bond theme is actually our opening song for the first and only time, but also a kind of a Calypso version of the nursery rhyme Three Blind Mice with new lyrics that actually reflect the intentions of the three assassins that I previously mentioned. They were apparently yeah. hired by Dr. No. Yeah, I liked the uh, opening song, even though it was the only one Tree that's never, like, the, the title song is not reflected in the title. It wasn't like a... A doctor nobody. It wasn't anything like that, so... He's doctor no, it. he never says yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it wasn't Sam Smith, the writings on the wall. But anyways, we'll get there much later. Maybe the movie's theme could be considered underneath the mango tree. Uh, it's not till later you hear it, but you fucking hear it a million times by the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it could be. It could be underneath the mango tree. I, 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 I don't know. It didn't really have a theme song. The James I'm, Bond I'm, theme was the theme. The, well, it, the James Bond theme was the theme, yes. The James Bond theme, famously written by Monty Norman, was based on a previous composition of his. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. John Barry, who would later go on to compose the music for 11 Bond films, actually arranged the Bond theme, but was uncredited. And it suggested that Barry, not Norman, composed it in the first place. Now, this song is just... It's super dope. It, there's a reason why it's as famous as it is. It literally embodies the character that it's, you know, personifying. It's cocky. It's swaggering. It, it's well, it's sexy. that baseline. I mean, yeah. let's let's be real. Like nothing carries a song like a baseline, and you've got that dum da da dum bum 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 da da dum bum, and then and then, then it hits you with the horns. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, that's great. So Monty Norman does the music for the movie. He does the James Bond theme. Now, the traditional J Jamaican Calypso, Under the Mango Tree, as previously mentioned by us, <laughs> is actually famously sung by Diana Kuplin, who was, at the time, Monty Norman's wife. So that's why we got that song. Right. She was also, by the way, the singing voice of Honey Ryder in this film. Oh. When she walks yeah, out on the ocean from yeah. Crab, Crab yeah. Key. Yep. Maurice Bender, of course, as uh, we said before, does the title sequence. Animations by Trevor Bond. There's your Bond name in the credits. That happens a lot. Yeah, there's always seems to be a Bond working on the film. That's weird, right? I've noticed that. Uh, our funny name in the credits today it was our editor, Peter Hunt. Peter Hunt. He's hunting them Peters. Hmm. Peter Hunt. Like, none of these names... I mean, I know these people were probably... I, and as I was watching the credits roll at the end of the movie... It's like the first three names, Sean Connery, Ursula Andrews, Jack Lord. And then everybody after that is like, eh, I don't know any of these people. I'm sure they're good. I'm sure they were hired for a great <laughs> reason. But yeah, none of them. No, don't know any of them. Who the fuck is Lewis Maxwell? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the guys' name was Colonel something. I was like, okay. Obviously, you went on to make a fortune. <laughs> he did, selling chicken in Kentucky. Yeah, it wasn't Sanders. The last name wasn't Sanders. Oh. No. Oh, yeah. fine. Yeah, one, of the, one of the tropes I notice about James Bond is, you know, the movie starts, the thing ends, and he goes in to get his mission, and he does his tropes, right? He, he, he throws the hat on the thing. He does all this stuff. But one thing he does, he, he, there's always a money penny pickup line, right? Yeah, but see... It was not so much a pickup line this time as overt flirtation, bordering on sexual mm -hmm. harassment. <laughs> I was about to say. Oh, you don't make me laugh too hard. No, for <laughs> real. That, was, that, that is not a lie. Uh, Bond enters by elevator, and they show him walking the hall, holding his hat in his hand the entire time yes. as he makes his way through MI6. Entering the small office with well, money, as penny, everybody he throws his knows, cap onto the wreck. You have to take your hat off when you, you enter don't. a building. Indoors. Back then, probably. Okay, that makes sense. Fair enough. You got me, you son of a bitch. <laughs> we don't even take our caps off at church. No, anymore. not anymore. No, we don't take our hats. Barely take them off for the American anthem, national anthem. I was like, there's, I wrote that there's no money penny pickup line, really. He makes a quip about her being government property and sits on her lap, awkwardly holding her hand and kissing her forehead the way I would my daughter after a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, 
Just a little borderline sexual <laughs> harassment. It's it, weird. It, it was it was also really creepy about it, it too. Well, I, I figured we'd get into this in a few more movies, but I gotta say, Sean Connery was probably the creepiest of the bond when it really? came to I mean, when it really? came to the women. Well, I guess we'll find out. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll watch I more we'll and we'll out. find out. But we'll it, see, it, I gotta watch more. I don't. I don't want to say he seemed the rapiest. And by more, I mean Roger more. But I think he was the rapiest. You're hurting my arm. Well, I'm going to break it if you don't do what I want you to do. Hey, fucking Roger Moore, come yeah, down. Yeah, yes, yes. Roger Moore was kind of rapey, too. Money Penny, uh, as I uh, mentioned, uh, well, I didn't mention, but I did mention her name. She's uh, famously portrayed here by Lewis Maxwell, who would continue to portray the character for a remarkable amount of time. Ye- probably too long. Yeah, probably too long, but I mean... She was my money penny for the longest time. Like, mm-hmm. that's that's she was the money the, penny for the, the longest money time. penny I grew up with, and and like I M&Q. always totally shipped Bond and Money Penny. It's like when are these two going to get together? For me, it was like the moonlighting thing that everybody enjoyed Dude, I, later on. It's like I thought the Brosnan era Bond was actually going to hook up with Money Penny. For I I thought so too. Right? It's like oh, it's finally going to happen. Bond and Money Penny. But yeah, nah, nah. nah, of course not. One thing that's another trope is he goes into the office after all that, and he always does an info brag, what I'm calling an info brag to M. M asks him, what do you know about this? And he's always like, not much. And then says everything fucking about it ever. And it's always so fucking weird. So Bond enters saying, good evening to M, who says it's 3 a.m. 007, when do you sleep? To which Bond replies, never on the firm's time, sir. I love that shit. But that also begs to differ. Dif- I mean, begs to question: Why is everybody in the office at three fucking a.m.? <laughs> I mean, shit's going down. They called him in because no one's answering out of Shrangways. I don't know. I, Fuck I, off. Well, yeah. What do you know about toppling Bond? Bond's like toppling a little, and then explains like literally everything about it. Like, I mean, how do you know he's talking about like missile and radar toppling? Anyways, like, how do you know he's not talking um, I about? I think like, you mis you misheard know? them. Matthew, it's not toppling, it's doppling, D-O-P-P, as in Doppler. Doppler radars were very big in this. No, they're, they're, to- they're toppling. They're, uh, I don't know. I think you misheard. I think they're toppling with the radar. They're, they're literally like toppling the rockets over and into the ocean. They're ruining <clears throat> the guidances. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, if they were talking about it in that context, I suppose they said toppling, but they were talking about radar, so I assume they were said doppling, which is yeah. a, a thing. No, they were doing, they were, they are saying toppling, because he doesn't say, oh, Doppler radar, it explains what Doppler radar is, he explains how, like, a rocket can be thrown off course and even brought down through these radar and radio interferences. He explains everything about it, literally, he goes, oh, a little bit, and explains everything about it. This is something that we are going to see become absolutely standard with Bond in these debriefs. Well, is yeah, it not standard in these or is it Sean Connery standard? Because I feel like... No, 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 no. It does not end. Mm. And Moore's worse than well, any of them. Moore's way worse. He looks so smug about it, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you'll see. You'll see. You'll see. Okay. You'll see. Bernard Lee, like Lois Maxwell, will become a standard of the Bond sets for years to come. Both outlasting many Bonds. Yeah. So, are we going to talk about the uh, Q or this? Uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah, we got the. Uh, this is the course of the the movie. You know, he goes in. He's talking to M. What's the mission? Well, Shrangway stopped reporting during a check in, and he's disappeared since. Even his secretary, which he points out, in this it does come out actually important later on. A new girl only just sent out there, and that's more for than just for pity. U.S. rockets have been interfered with by some radio jammer that's sending its rockets tumbling into uncontrolled descents into unplanned locations. And this is bad news for NASA. A $5 million rocket that was supposed to land in the Atlantic ended up in a forest of Brazil. And I'm like, huh. Okay. So can, can we talk about the money back in the 60s? Can we, can we talk about how physics just called and said none of that made sense? Yeah, yeah, well... I'm not really sure how that happened, even if someone messed with the rockets. How are you supposed to land in the middle of the Atlantic in the north? I, no, it's like, I don't know. Well, if they're shooting from Cape Canaveral. In 1962, this thing's going up for like 15 minutes. It's going on a short arc into the Atlantic. It's not ending up in Brazil. No. <laughs> even if toppled. Even if toppled. If toppled, it's falling in Florida. Mm, yeah. 
You want to talk about the money, by the way? I did look this up. That's cheap as fuck for a rocket or satellite, even then. Oh, yeah. Actually. Actually, yeah. Because if I remember correctly, the original Apollo missions ran in the near hundreds of million. Uh, the average rocket for, to carry a satellite was about 10 times as much as they said this one was. I actually thought it was going to be cheaper. I did think they overestimated it. I looked it up and I was wrong. You were right. No, no. They didn't overestimate. It's just $5 million is a remarkable. Remarkably like, cheap. Cheap. No wonder it No wonder it ended in Brazil. <laughs> yeah, right? No wonder. It's like, I don't think the toppling had anything to do with it. I don't think the toppling had anything to do with it. You guys just built a shitty rocket. <laughs> Lowest common denominator. He's like, blame yeah. Jamaica. <laughs> Bond needs to get his ass down to Jamaica and investigate Strangway's death. See if it relates to this toppling that's got the CIA buzzing. M mentions a CIA operative, specifically by the name of Felix Leiter, and he asks Bond if he knows him. Like, spies have barbecues or something. But the weird thing is, is he says he doesn't know him, but he's heard of him. Where in the, how in the world do everyone know these spies? Like, they're celebrities. Like, how are they spies? Well, here, it's it's supposed to be, like, a closed circle of people, right? Like, of course he's heard of Felix Leiter. There's been CIA missions, and they've been on the same continent before. And, you know, people are like, oh, this CIA guy, Felix oh, Leiter. Oh, this, this badass this American this this. agent you know I've heard of him. They've heard of him all the way to Timbuktu. Blowfield knows my name. There's no reason that for That was an to... Ian Fleming thing from the books, you know. Like, stupid. He was paying Still respect stupid. to his respect. Well. <laughs> Still stupid. Not really stupid, because even back in the OSS, like, British agents knew the who the dope-ass American agents were, and vice versa, That's even though not, they were Our own spies. agents don't know each other, and our police arrest well, our federal is, agents, and vice this versa. This is now. We're talking about, you know, we're coming 20 years off the heels of World War II? I think like, you're confusing real life with the uh, Peter Graves' Mission Impossible show from back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then nobody would know who anybody was. Like, you remember what spies were like back in the 60s on TV. Oh, I, I remember reading definitive articles about the OSS, and they talk about other spies. Like, how do they know they exist? This week on CIA Digest, Major Secrets. What has Julian Assange they, been up it's to? It's mostly because they had to work so hand-in-hand hand during the war, and then the Cold War happened, so, you know, they're still working kind of hand-in-hand. I'm sure British agents knew American agents. So, Q gadgets. While Bond is talking to M, a man enters with a small case, and M requests Bond's weapon. He gets a stern talking to about his Beretta, and a not Q, but is totally Q, Major Boothroyd, who is played by Peter Burton in his only appearance in the role, gives him his famous Walther PPK, the icon that it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I just want to get into the whole Walther Beretta argument here because the beretta is a fine piece of italian machinery and apparently in the movie it jammed on bond once in 10 fucking years <laughs> that's true he does say that by the way i'll give you he that. says that right yes i've I, he, he says those were i've had this gun for 10 years and it, it it jammed once in 10 years now granted it was an inopportune time and i guess it almost cost him his life but M insists yeah, it only takes that he one. use the Walther PPK. Why? Why do you think that? And is? this is what this is what this is why I think that the Walther PPK was introduced because, as we were saying in the books and everything, he carried a Beretta. The Walther was introduced because the Walther is an English weapon of notorious irreliability. That is a piece of shit gun. Oh, so you're saying it's the same reason they put the, like the BMWs in there or something? All right, well, let me interrupt you then for a second. Bond carried in the novels up to this point, the 25 millimeter Beretta. It was a small and easily concealable weapon that Fleming actually had during his actual days of spycraft, and that's why he was using it. Yes. Now, Gregory Boothroyd, a real person, had written to Fleming saying that Bond would not use a lady's gun. He'd need more protection. And Fleming, instead of deleting the comment like I would have, just straight asked what gun he should use. And in the next novel which was Dr. No, because right. it wasn't the first one written, a major Boothroyd named after Gregory Boothroyd himself, who would become Q, this whiner complainer actually became Q, right. gives him his new weapon, which is a German weapon manufactured in Germany, France, and the U.S., practically everywhere but the U.K., uh, the Walther PPK. Ah, uh, well, it's still a piece of shit. 
yes, that's fair. <laughs> and like that was the only reason that I could figure that they would give him a Walther. They gave him a Walther and a revolver that he stopped giving him a couple missions in. Yeah, I believe the revolver was a thirty-eight, but a long barrel. I can't remember. Here, here's your Q gadget. If, you know, if it's not a, your your Walther, he gets a Geiger counter later sent from home office. So I guess that counts. <laughs> There really was no Q in this movie, and there are no gadgets. And there's Major Boothroyd. He's Q. Yeah, but there, there's a Geiger counter. That's a gadget. Yeah, it's a tool. <laughs> <laughs> They're all tools. Uh, yeah. Um, and so are this we. movie was not bad for lack of gadgets. Uh, it's not that it's I, they, how, they didn't they weren't making a Bond movie yet. They didn't know. Well, that, that, I think they brought gadgets yeah. out because like. I don't know if there was very, very many gadgets in the next one either, but I'm pretty sure our man mm. Flint came mm -mm. out about the same time. Red Grant immediately pulls a garrot out of his watch, you know, out of his watch, his timing watch. Yeah. Attachment on his watch. So, like, they did kind of hit with the gadgets, the, the more, like, spy gadgets, like, immediately. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose you're right. So Bond gets uh, his gun and he leaves and he goes back to his hotel with orders to pretty much just to head immediately to Jamaica. I mean, like immediately. And so he leaves and he finds Sylvia Trench has B and E'd her way into his hotel room and is wearing nothing but one of his button ups. Totally his type of woman. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And if I got play like that, I would be a little freaked out, to be honest. I mean... That's all sorts of red flags in this day and age. A woman breaks into your hotel room just waiting for you. For you, <laughs> for him, he's like, hey, that's my woman. That's probably why she's the only sexual interest to show up in back-to-back -back films until the Craig era. Well, yeah, there's that. And Bond charges after red flags like a bull. So, you know. <laughs> oh, you're married? What up? <laughs> and away we go. Away we go. Transition to a lovely shot of an extinct giant bird known as a Pan Am. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. so can we talk about resist. good old Pan America? Like back in the no, no, let's no. back in the day, Pan America was no. the airlines to be on. It was one of the only the international were hot. airlines that flew from America continentally, you know, or across the big pond. And now they're gone, so fuck them. Well, yeah, now they're gone. <laughs> you Just know. another iconic blip of our past. It, but this is before, you know, the commercialization of movies to boot. So, you know, Pan Am was a big deal to make it into the movies. That's fair. That's fair. It's like, hey, look, we stood outside an airport and shot a plane. Now we're legit. Right. <laughs> so this transition goes into uh, Kingston Airport in Jamaica, and it actually is Kingston Airport in Jamaica at the time. So if it looks like a really shitty set, that's just how basic their airport was back then. That's almost how basic every airport was back then. This is before metal detectors even. I s actually said in my notes here, right on cue, the set, like many uh, in the movie, are modest but effective, as a lot of the scenes are location shots at a time when technology was just much simpler. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean... Is how I wrote that, apparently. It was also probably a little cheaper to film there, too, instead of trying to build a whole airport. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, well, fuck yeah. Well, it's probably easier to get permission, too, because it's smaller back then. But, yeah. And not as many security risks that, that they were always looking out for back then. But a Felix Leiter, as played by Jack Lord, oh, just kind of snoops on Lord. Bond. Good Lord. He kind of snoops on Bond in the background. Yeah, Hawaii 5 -0. A young Oklahoma. Jack Lord. That's what I wrote in my notes. Like, good lord, Jack Lord. <laughs> he's like snooping on Bond every which way to where like he's behind Bond's back, but anyone else in the airport would be like, Why is that guy pretending to get on the phone then not and pretending to look at his watch he's not wearing? I, I have to say, what overall spy craft in this movie, I'm gonna have to give it an F. <laughs> 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 because it was dude, awful. Dude. <laughs> There's some powder on his briefcase and a hair over his closet. And I thought they were both cool, but we'll talk about it later. It leads to nothing. In fact, he doesn't even check his bathroom upon realizing that someone had at some point been in his apartment. Yeah, I'm sorry, hotel. Yeah. And could still be in it. Yeah. I, like I said, the spy craft in this movie was not. And we'll, not, we'll not talk about point. it as we go along, but no. 
they immediately fixed that in the next they movie. They did too. immediately fix that in the next movie, but yeah, this one, there was all sorts of, uh, anyway, well, yeah. I said, we aren't supposed to know who this guy snooping on Bond is, but we know it's Felix Leiter. It's Mr. Hawaii Five-0 himself. It's the only other character you recognize in the movie, so yeah, we all know it's Felix. <laughs> no, one, no, we, no, one, no one knows that yet. This is 1962, you fucker. We just know, uh, we just know he's peeping on Bond, okay? In 62, Jack Lord is a pretty big name. Still. But we don't know we don't know what he's doing in this film. We don't know who he is. He could be the bad guy. He could be Dr. Now. He could no. be the bad guy. Well, I suppose if it's the first time you ever saw this, he could be the bad guy. He's Dr. Never, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, he is following Bond through the airport. Totally scoping. Yeah. Bond walks toward the airport exit, and a few things happen very quickly. Okay. First, a woman tries to take a photo of Bond, but the savvy bastard that he is, he holds a hat over his face as he passes and she flashes. It's, it's almost like it was scripted. It was so well-timed. Next, he and two girls hail a cab at the same time. Bond, being a madman era male, doesn't even hesitate to take the cab. <laughs> doesn't even hesitate. He's straight getting in. He doesn't offer it to him. He's like, the women here are some of the strongest in the series, by the way, too, because one of them straight calls him out on it. And he's like, oh, shit, my bad. Yeah, you take it. He did have a little snarl to his acquiesce, but it was mostly genuine and comes off that way. It, uh, yeah. Kudos to Connery on the nuances, by the way. Uh, honestly. Kudos to Connery about, for the nuances. I, well, I think he was just... Because you do pick him up a lot. I think he was just playing as a man in the 60s. He was hungry. Like, I, well, no, was no, hungry. no, no. I think he, he, was, I think he was just he was hungry. playing normal era attitudes he wasn't sick of playing bond yet he was hungry he's desperately trying to make a name for himself that he would make a name that he would and just like a lot of great actors before and since you know like they had a lot more to give when they were hungrier oh yeah well absolutely absolutely next after the woman after the women take the taxi it's after the women take the taxi that Bond almost just got in, by the way. That, yeah. The only reason he didn't is because this random woman called him out. Uh, after the, he's approached by this timid and withdrawn man that can barely get out his words. And, and this is the character. It's actually not bad acting. It's a, it immediately gives him a way to Bond, too. Like, this guy, like, what were you going to do? Like, he says Bond's name, and it says he's sent as a chauffeur from Government House for him. But... All this he didn't have the courage to say until Bond was almost in a taxi and gone. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But this is a good example of good spy crap. Because the first thing James does is he fucking calls the office and says, Hey, yo, did you send a car to pick me up? Yep. Bond tells him to mine the bags. He's going to go phone the hotel to check his reservation. Yeah. His deception and control of the situation is subtle, but just masterful. Oh, yeah. You know, he... Because the guy's like, oh, I could do it. And he's like, no, you know, you mind, you mind the bags, you know, I, I got this. At the payphone, he calls the government house to make sure they didn't send a driver as it didn't seem like something either party would have expected from the other. Right. So the head of government house is a man named Playdell Smith. And Playdell Smith is one of Strangway's card fellows that we saw in the opening scene. And uh, as I said, the head of government house, he said no driver was sent and they'd still meet at one to which Bond replies, well, don't mind me if I'm a few minutes late. <laughs> so pretty smart he wants to find out who sent the car and why so if you know it's a trap why not just go ahead and jump in right if you know it's a trap why not not fall in it if i see a pit of quicksand i'll just gonna walk around it maybe that's just me well okay what if somebody sent the pit of quicksand and you wanted to find out who it was i don't, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> fuck them fuck them <laughs> They don't seem like cool people I want to know. Right? <laughs> I'm a bad secret agent. The Why world just did ended. you send a pit of quicksand? <laughs> we ran out of tarantulas. Lighter watches Bond go off with who, with someone who he knows to be a pawn of Dr. No and gets in a... Wait, are, are you saying that, that Felix, Felix noticed Bond get into the car with somebody who, who, who he knew mm -hmm. was a pawn of yeah. Dr. No? Yeah, Felix Felix watched Bond drive off with this random driver, and Felix, to his mind as well, like, well, I just saw this guy get in the car with a Dr. No Pond. I hope he's on our side. Now I can't be sure. Uh, Felix gets in his 1961 Chevrolet Impala with Quarrel, a character we'll meet later to give chase. We only really see kind of like the back of his head, but it is him driving. 
Mr. Jones, who's the driver with Bond, and Bond drive off in a convertible 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air. Now, I bring up these cars because, like, cars are a big thing with Bond, and they're always, like, Aston Martin, BMW. And in this, they're all, like, Chevrolet. Well, in this, they only had a million dollars. So uh, if you got a Chevy, then that's what we're driving. <laughs> what do we got on the lot? The caterer has a Chevy. Right. What do we got on the lot? Oh, that looks good. This 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air is being driven by Mr. Jones at speed with Bond's hat barely moving in the convertible the entire time. So uh, I want to talk about the movie safety of the 60s while we're on, on this uh uh, and like i gotta say there was none to be honest like some of some of the higher speed scenes that you know were cutaways and side shots and everything where they were actually they're just under moving at speed yeah they're just under yeah i i realize there's some of them are under but if you look at the tires and the dust and everything you can see that some of those cars are moving fairly fast in those dirt roads and those old cars oh there's they're still under <laughs> <laughs> weren't safe at all you see, Mr. Jones is driving Bond at speeds up to 55 to 60 miles an hour. Oh my gosh, so dangerous. And most of that's on a blue screen. Yeah, most. That's why his hat that's doesn't move in a convertible. Yes, that's why his hat doesn't move in a convertible. It's real unsafe. Bond, having earlier just suggested a leisurely drive, asks about the speed. Mr. Jones says they're being followed. So Bond says, well, you better lose him. And through the power of sped up footage, we whip around a corner and watch the other car drive away, unaware of the artful dodge. Bond knows this guy isn't from Government House, but he doesn't know that the other car was CIA, so he logically assumes that it's just this guy's friend. So when Mr. Jones nervously is wiping the sweat from his forehead, Bond puts the muzzle of his gun to the back of his head and says, you know, start talking before your friends double back. And of course this guy denies everything, the stuff he knows, the stuff he's confused about. And so Bond's like, all right, you know, get out of the vehicle, put up your hands, you know, keep them where I can see you. But Mr. Jones tries to sneak a gun from the glove box. And Bond does his famous Sean Connery judo chop on his arm, pushes him out of the car. I just like... The guy tries to... Oh, go ahead. No, I was just saying, the guy tries to kick Bond. Bond catches his leg, tosses him to the ground, and tells him to get up so he could shoulder toss him on the ground again. i just like to point out that this was a really good establishing trope of showing that James Bond has some form of martial arts training as opposed to just a brawler. Judo. Yeah, judo, but, you know, it didn't look like judo. Anyway, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, I, I mean, it was... It's supposed to it's be It's supposed judo. to be judo, absolutely. It's, it's Sean Connery judo. <laughs> 100% Sean Connery judo. When pressed for info, Mr. Jones asked for a cigarette from his case, which Bond stupidly gives to him. I just, I can't, I, I just can't, I'm sorry. I guess things were different. Yeah. Yeah, things are different because there's a lot of that kind of shit in this movie. I, and, <laughs> Do I? and that's what I was I saying know, about you're my the, prisoner. I'm not giving you any spycraft of this movie getting an F because there is a lot of that in this movie. But yeah, yeah, the man bites into the cigarette, and of course, oh no, cyanide capsule hidden in the smokes. <laughs> like I said, stuff will kill you. Yeah, he says to hell with you, and he dies. So this, by the way, makes the stolen Chevrolet. The first car that we see Bond drive on screen. Mwah. Yeah. Not an Aston. Not an Aston. Not a, no, 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 no. Chevrolet Bel Air. All right. 1957. Yeah. That's your first Bond. A lot of people erroneously put it as the Alpine Sunbeam that we later see him driving to Miss Taro's house. But no, it is this piece of shit. He drives it up to the government house with the body in the passenger seat. Oh. I do have a, 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 this is the first of the one-liners, and I think this is where action movies started getting him, because he's dropped a few. Make sure he doesn't get away. Like, <laughs> I do love he that. He says about the dead body mm -hmm. in the car. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. At the government yeah. house, Playdell Smith welcomes Bonds, answers his basic questions about Strangways. Yeah, Bond pulls up in the Bel Air, and he looks at uh, the superintendent, and he goes... Yeah, he does. He goes, make sure he doesn't get away. The superintendent just looks at it. He does a double take. He looks at him like he's asleep. Then he looks back like, wait, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. He tells, yeah. So Plato Smith in Government House tells uh, Bond about Shrangways, uh, about Professor Dent and Potter, who were the last two to see him, uh, besides himself at that card game. 
Bond wants to meet them socially instead of having them brought in. And before they do that, they want to head to Strangway's place to see what clues it holds. So it's there that he finds that Strangway's had sent something into a laboratory run by Professor Dent through a receipt. He also finds a picture of a local fisherman identified by the accompanying Commissioner Duff as Quarrel. Kind of like a top local fishing guide type of guy. Bond makes him as the guy that was driving the car that was tailing him from the airport. He literally says that, so. Mm, I didn't, I missed that part. But yeah, that's cool. Transition to Bond's hotel room, and a bellhop is pouring him his signature vodka martini, mixed, not stirred, as he said. When the help leaves, Bond sets about setting up some genuine spy craft, putting fingerprint dust on his briefcase locks and a hair over his closet entry. He kits up, suits up, and we transition to the club. Now, what do you want to say? I know you do. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, he's like, no. We've already talked about the spy craft. He's like, I've gotten it out before we got there. Playdell Smith has taken Bond to sit with him, Professor Dent and Potter, but... Before the crossfade can even settle, Dent is talking about Shrangways. He's, he's talking about his disappearances, is odd, and then immediately segues to his hot secretary. <laughs> like, immediately. Immediately. <laughs> he, just, he just, he's like, he's like, oh yeah, Shrangways, oh yeah, that was, that was weird, wasn't it? Oh yeah, but uh, anyways, that secretary, woo, too bad she's dead. Like, this guy could not be any more sus. Uh, yeah. He's a, what, what we would call a ladies' man. <laughs> He he talks about Strangways having a, a new secretary and, and even talks about like what she looks like and stuff like that. Even though like she's so new, like Bernard Lee says we just sent her over and that's how M knows like he, he he knew more than the others. Well, yeah. Yeah. That's how M knows because well, you know. I said in my notes, this guy literally like goes from talking crap about Shrangways to talking about how hot his secretary was. The secretary we literally just saw as a blood spot on the floor two scenes ago. So the movie is literally trying all it can to let you know this Dent guy isn't right. <laughs> yeah, yes. We find out Shrangways was going out with Quarrel on the boat under the disguise of a fishing habit. Um, that's what he told his card buddies. Now transitioning to a beach, we see Bond approach Quarrel, who is played by John Kitzmiller, as he's painting a boat. Bond introduces himself, saying he was a friend of Shrangway's, and Quarrel says, Ain't that nice. I like people who are friends with people. <laughs> the one-liners one in this were all right. They were brilliant, even. It was fucking great. Ain't that nice. I like people who are friends with people. He just smiles at him like, fuck off. <laughs> it's lovely. Quarrel rebuffs Bond's attempts for a conversation. He walks off toward a tiki bar run by a man uh, named Pussfeller, who's played by Lester Prendergast. Quarrel sends Bond to the back room to talk and tries to ambush him with a knife. Pussfeller grabs Bond from behind, and Bond flips him into Quarrel and a bunch of red stripe boxes, because it's Jamaica. It's Jamaica, and it's red stripe beer. And I don't believe <laughs> Bond would have, I mean, two Jamaicans got the drop on you? Uh... But judo, Sean Connery judo. <laughs> Sean, Sean Connery judo, for real. For real. As he's backing out, Felix Leiter pulls a gun on him and has Bond frisked. They ask about each other's suit tailors as a code, and everyone kind of exit the scenes on the same size. He's like, oh, you're Washington, your tailors in Washington, mine's in Seville Row, you know. So we dissolve to a night at Pussfeller's Tiki Bar, same place, but it's hopping now. There's this band playing. Next to them, uh, next to the band, as Pussfeller travels the floor, like it's kind of like this nice little tracking shot with Pussfeller going through the floor. Yeah, yeah, it was all uh, right. You can see the airport photographer girl staring down the camera as he pans back. <laughs> <laughs> Fire that girl. Fire her. The guys are sitting at a table having a conversation that feels like it should have happened right after the fight, but okay, I guess we're happening it now later. You know, in hindsight and retrospect, they probably did that to establish the the girl staring into the camera. They wanted you to focus on her, and that's one way to it, do it. It worked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. Cuz I mean, that's where this uh, uh, I mean, this whole scene starts to revolve around her, so they did want you to focus on her, and they focused on her on the pan just a little too long to be, like, natural. So, yeah, of course, yeah. They don't focus on her really on the pan at all. Like, if she wasn't staring at the camera, you might not notice her. Maybe you're right. Yeah. That's the one way to do it. <laughs> yeah. 
the conversation is mostly everything we know so far just spelled out and with a few more slight gaps filled in. We learn that Shrangways thinks that the toppling signals were coming from an island nearby. And he was going out with Coral to check these locations, including one called Crab Key. And that one wasn't checked as thoroughly, Coral says. As Bond begins to ask why, the airport photographer snaps a photo of the clandestine conversation and Bond sends Quirrell after her and the camera. Quirrell wrenches her arm behind her, toes her back to the table, and he's like holding her down in place with her arm behind her back. Mm -hmm. And Bond takes the camera, exposing the film to the light before returning it, and the girl breaks this like crystal looking thing on the table leg. And that like, crystal looking thing, Matthew, was a flash. Because that's the way flashes were back in the day. It was a light bulb. Is that what that was? That's what that was. It, it was a flash, a camera flash bulb. My whole life. I just wondered what the fuck that was. Oh, yeah. Back in the day, cameras, you know, you took a picture, the bulb would... And then it would be done. So you had to take the bulb out and replace the bulb and then take another picture. She rakes that thing all the way down, and he barely flinches. He smiles even, saying, We don't get nothing out of this gal. You wants me to break her arm? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that shit was hilarious. Like, <laughs> you know, I'm just going to stab him in the face, and he's not even going to flinch. Like, And then threaten to break her arm. Old James Bond was savage as fuck. Yeah, yeah. Her refusal to talk and the threat of a broken arm in Mr. Jones' cyanide suicide makes James kind of wonder how bad their master really is that they fear him more than death. Quarrel also says that Crab Key scares him and that the locals think there's a dragon there. An odd Chinese man named Dr. No owns it and guards it heavily, and Quarrel and Shrangways snuck on the island and took Geosample. I'm it's sorry, raw. I'm sorry. Did they say Chinese? Mm-hmm. Dr. No is supposed to be Chinese? The, I am quoting Jack Lord's lighter here, an odd Chinese man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Owns it, guards it heavily, goes by Dr. No. I don't know why I missed that line. Coral says they got bits of rock, sand, and water, so I wrote that down. Yeah, I, uh, I've i never thought Dr. No was Chinese. He is half Chinese, half German. Um, I would not even guess that. And I think he's played by a Canadian. Hey, I'm pretty sure that's true. <laughs> quick fade to the three blind mice sneaking through a parking lot and bonds pulling up to his hotel in a taxi as one goes to take the shot a car drives by and they duck out of the light like okay but by the time they stand again bond has entered the hotel so bond just entered the hotel okay yeah remember that yeah yeah now a random passerby just saved bond from being obliviously sniped in in his first aired adventure i'm just saying right <laughs> Deus Carana. It was just, just, just luck. Just luck. Bond, Bond gets saved a lot by luck, and he even kind of points it out later on, too. Like, he's very much a man in this adventure, and I love it. Bond then stops by Dent's lab and asks him about Strangway's receipt for the samples there. But Dent just shrugs this off as worthless iron ore, like those samples they were getting. Right, It's right. just an amateur obsession of his. Bond is like, ah, okay, buddy, no worries, and takes his receipt back from him. And, like, make sure he gets it back from him and leaves. Right. He he goes to leave, but of course, not without going to say, you know, good morning to the desk girl on the way out. Oh, well. Super classy. Again, a ladies' man. <laughs> I love, I do love that on the way out. He's like, oh, morning, lady. Yeah, gotta, gotta have that in there. After the meeting, a panic dent drives his 1961 Vauxhall Velo to a boat and rides out to Crab Key to report to Dr. No. There's a lot of great uses of lines uh, in the shots during the sequence, and we get our first evil lair our first super awesome ken adam set it's just this large sterile room with a small stool in the corner under this huge circular and gridded sky window it's an absolutely gorgeous set yeah oh yeah it's nice it's i mean it's really nice back that you know because everything was done so practically like i guess it kind of made everything a little cooler back in the day it's like if they really tried it looked really good this guy was really amazing with his large sets. And one thing I noticed is, is he's really into curves. He liked to put curves into everything. And it really comes off really elegant and beautiful. Yeah. Well, it's the style of the 60s. You can't beat that old school Art Deco style. It's like that retro future. That retro future. There it is. The future retro. That 60s future retro. 
We hear Dr. No here, but we don't see him. He tells Dent that he's a fuck up, and it's all his fault Bond's gotten this far. He gives him a tarantula. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, God. I can't, say, I can't say that without laughing. And he tells him to go kill Bond with it tonight. So, yeah, yeah go, go. let me go off on this for a minute here. <laughs> As an assassination tool, a poisonous spider is probably not the best option for a myriad of reasons. Ow, what was that? Oh, man, I'm going to the hospital. That looks like a bite. Well, that, reason number one. That's if the spider has successfully bite somebody. Reason number two. What if the spider doesn't bite somebody? Like, you can't guarantee a poisonous spider is going to reason bite somebody. Reason number three. The fatal percentage of... You know, lethal spider bites is usually pretty low, and especially if I go to a hospital. Uh, I don't know very many poisonous tarantulas. <laughs> Dying, dude. Like, there's... I, it's a I, black I widow get tarantula. It. I get it. They were trying to be creepy and trying to be, you know, cutting or edgy or whatever. Giant spider. Come on, man. A spider? Like, this dude is supposed to be a fucking genius. Like, <laughs> a spider? Check this out. Remember Bond entered the hotel earlier before we cut to all this? Yeah, cut yeah. to Bond entering the hotel again. And it's the, literally, like, the supposed to be from him coming in from almost getting assassinated. So this is just bad editing. Right. And, and even if we were immediately just saying, oh, we're going back to that same moment, we've already seen him walk in through the doors from a different perspective. Right. So the girl at the front desk gives him keys to a car that he's ordered, which has just arrived, and looks him up and down on his way out. She was thirsty, boy. <laughs> They're all thirsty. And all of these movies, all of the girls are thirsty. For Bond. No one else. Yeah. Not me. Not you. Not me. Not you. James motherfucking Bond. Bond enters his hotel. He sees the hair is gone from the doors of his closet and fingerprints all over his briefcase. Again, I love the spycraft here. But seeing that someone was in his room and he doesn't immediately like look any further, he just gets a bunch of vodka and tucks into it. Like that really bothered me. Yeah, like he doesn't search his room, look under the bed, he doesn't check anywhere. He he doesn't like look in the closet or, or go to the bathroom and like see if there's anyone in there. Which in many later James Bond movies, people are hiding in the bathroom in his hotel. Yeah, you know, if his spycraft would have been good, he would have found a poisonous spider. Like I'm just saying. <laughs> It was pretty big. I wouldn't have missed that fucker. Then they dissolve to later in the hotel and Bond's asleep, but immediately woken by something moving up his sheets. No, it's not Freddy Krueger. It's someone's pet. It's the producer's kid's pet. It's a scene where a tarantula walks over Bond, and it was initially shot with a protective glass between Connery and the spider, who would do this again with sharks because he's a pussy. Fuck y'all, I don't care. Come at me. Uh, well, maybe he's afraid of spiders. I won't let the tarantula crawl on me. Maybe he's afraid of spiders. A lot of people are. I'm not, but whatever. And being afraid of sharks is fucking reasonable. I don't give a fuck who you are. <laughs> they were tiny. And pets. Yes. So the director, Terrence Young, he did not like the final results. And, and there's obviously so, uh, plenty of shots where because they wanted to see Connery's face with the spider on. So there are shots in the final film where you can see the glare, especially on 4K. Oh, not 4K. Well, like the high def releases. Oh, yeah. So the scenes were interlaced with new footage featuring the tarantula over Bob Simmons, our stuntman from earlier. Yeah. Connery was sweating so hard during this scene. And afterwards, I noticed that he went straight to the bathroom instead of bed. Like he shit himself and needed to clean up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. I think Sean Connery's really afraid of spiders. That could be. That could be a thing. Because, I mean, that sweat didn't look like they sprayed him down. That, no. <laughs> that, that looked like real ass sweat. And I was wondering, he's like, is it hot in Jamaica? Like, what the hell? Why did it have to be spiders? Right. At Government House the next day, Bond asked Playdell Smith for the files on Dr. No, and the secretary, Miss Taro, played by Xena Marshall, says that they were gone, both of them, and blamed Strangways. He says he, he took his own files. Playdell Smith gives Bond a parcel from his home, and Bond decided to exit the office from the lobby entrance door instead of the customary rear exit. And this is how he catches Miss Taro eavesdropping. Nasty habit, he says. 
And she, she again lies, by the way, about this. And she's like, no, I'm just putting this away. Right. Bond asks her out, and she plays coy. And the suave charm here works for the area, but would like literally these lines would come off so odd and blank nowadays and creepy and weird. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I like, I don't know. It's definitely Mad Men era. It worked for them, but like nowadays, if I said these things to a girl, she would just be like, get the fuck away from me. What's wrong with you? The parcel that he was given was actually the Geiger counter. We got our Q gadget. <laughs> yes, a whole Geiger counter. He tests the rowboat that they stored Shrangway samples uh, from Crab Key with the Geiger counter, and it proved that the samples were radioactive. Even if Dent said that they were, even though, sorry, that uh, Professor Dent said that they were just worthless iron ore. Yeah. Yeah. So Bond bon was like, Coral, take us over to Crab Key. And Coral was like, no, I did that once. I ain't doing that again. I ain't taking nobody on no boats over to no keys, man. They don't do a man good to tempt fate twice. Can we and talk about their Jamaican accents there for a quick second, too? I mean, Coral was supposed to be Jamaican. He didn't have a Jamaican accent. Well, none of the main actors were Jamaican. Those were only the extras. Yeah. Well, not really Jamaican. Yeah. All the extras were Jamaican, but we'll get, it, we'll, we'll get, into, that. We'll get into that later. Yeah. <laughs> Felix and Bond are like, all right, fine, you don't want to go, that's cool, we'll go alone. And Quarrel's like, nah, I'll be here at seven. So basically, Quarrel is like, I ain't letting these two white men call me no kind of pussy. No, I guess, I guess that's immediately what happens. <laughs> Even the fine that we get from Bond about this, he's like, oh, okay, fine. It, it sounds so confused and nonplussed about the exchange, and I kind of love it, because again, I cannot reiterate like how much nuance Connery actually brought to this role. Yeah, no, he did a good job. He did a good job. I, I, I mean, it's clear why he was chosen to carry on after this, because he yeah. did a fantastic job. I mean, it was not bad at all in the role. Meanwhile, Bond has a message to call back Miss Taro, who wants him to come up to her mountain house instead of going to his hotel. It's nice and cool, and he can enjoy the view. So he gets into his rented 1961 Sunbeam Alpine silver convertible, which is often mistakenly confused as his first car and this car feels like the only bond car of the movie <laughs> it well, really that, because it really is the only bond car in the movie all the other cars were stolen <laughs> our government house yeah when he goes up the winding mountain dirt road the lasalle funeral coach with the three blind mice and their driver comes out behind him bond goes under some heavy machinery in his low convertible leaving the assassins to fly off the side of the mountain and blow up so can we talk about the safety features in cars in the 60s? They didn't... <laughs> oh, that explosion was so cheap. The special effects, man. I don't know if you notice this. It's a split cut, but the uh, car that went down the edge was not the LaSalle Funeral. No, it was coach. not. It was a Humber Super Snipe MK11. It was used as a stand-in when the vehicle drives off the cliff. Yeah. The scrawny local construction worker, inexplicably with Quarrel's voice, asked, How did it happen? <laughs> To which Bond says, I think they were on their way to a funeral. Right? On their way to a funeral. I put that down. That's in my notes. More one-liners. Bond makes it to Tara's place, surprising her since she knew there was a trap set. She's a very bad liar. And Bond goes to kiss her, and she begs him to please let her go. And he says, oh, my bad. I thought I was invited to admire the view. To mind the, admire the view. Like, you gave me the entendre. I'm here to double up on it. You know, what up, girl? <laughs> She gets a call from someone saying he was coming, and she's like, oh, yeah, he's here now. And doesn't know what happened, but, but he's there. But Bond listens in, doesn't he? Yeah. We infer that she's told to keep him there until someone gets there, and Bond and Taro bang a while. Then he tries to leave for food. But because he knows it's a trap. Yep. Yeah. And he's like, well, she wants to stay in as ordered. He calls government house under the guise of calling a cab, and Coded says, come snag this bitch. He then goes to kiss her to pass the time, and she says, hey, careful, watch my nail varnish, you know? Commandant Duff pulls up, and Bond puts her in the back of that 1959 Ford console, the one, the government house car, the same car they were going around town earlier in. Yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, be careful of her nail varnish when he's putting her in, and she right. spits on him. He goes back inside her place to make it look like neither of them ever left, and he waits with his trap set. Underneath the mango. I wonder how many times he listened to that record. Right? Because it seemed like he was there for a little while. Yeah, I wrote my notes. He's playing solitaire and listening to Under the Mango Tree, probably on repeat. <laughs> probably on repeat. 
After a while, Professor Dent shows up and opens the door, sliding in a silenced pistol, which he fires six times into some pillows Bond put on the bed as a body double. So After shooting, Dent entered the room, and Bond gets him to disarm and sit down. Bond points out that he was the only one that had seen Strangway as his new secretary and failed to tell him about the radioactivity in the samples. Dent is, like, inching towards his gun that he had dropped, and he's, like, inching it back closer to him with his foot on the rug. This is, like, old-school cinema cat and mouse at its best. The tension buildup with Dent's anxiety, like, it's perfectly juxtaposed by Bond's casual apathy here. He even, like, keeps looking away from Dent to, like, light his match and cigarette like he doesn't even care. He's toying with him. Dent acts like he's about to talk and he dies for his weapon, but click, click. Bond says just smooth and cool as possible. It's a Smith and Wesson, and you've had your six. Well, a couple of things here. Why didn't he do that instead of the spider the first time around? (laughs) (laughs) Just shoot him the first? (laughs) And secondly, if you're interrogating the man and you know his gun is empty, why shoot him? I'm sure you had a couple of more questions you could have asked. But nah, he pulled a gun. He tried to shoot me. He's like, look, your death is going to be cool. I'll get this information later or I'll, you know, it'll be fine. We're only going to blow up a nuclear reactor in the Caribbean. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Great. Transition to Felix and Quarrel by the docks. James speeds up in his Alpine and asks if everything is ready. And Felix snaps, yeah, for the last two hours. They take a small boat out to Crab Key before Quarrel says, that's about as far as it can go on the engine, Captain. Bond and Coral transition to this, like, dinghy that they've towed along and leave Lighter to, like, jerk off, I guess. Yeah, he's got to take the boat back to uh, his American buddies and get them ready. <sighs> to come back with the boat, I guess. <laughs> Still afraid of this dragon, Coral is, like, downing rum from this jug. And Lighter's just like, hey, if you see a dragon, just breathe on him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to say that was slightly racist, but it seemed like it was. Yeah, d- huh? <laughs> Madman era. Where's your Madman era explanation now, you son of a bitch? Yeah, yeah it was, it's the Madman era. I'm, no, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. At the island, they put down the cell and stow the boat, covering it with some palm fronds. To be fair, the white man actually just orders the black man to do it, and then he just says, I'm going to go take a nap until morning. But they do cover it. Yeah. He goes, cover this up. I'm going to go over there and take a nap until morning. It's just like, you fucking asshole. He's like an amazing agent. Yes. <laughs> The scene ends with Coral looking for dragons and chugging rum. The next morning, Bond wakes up on the beach to a woman singing that damn mango tree song again. <laughs> he pervs on her in this iconic bathing suit. He's like looking at her for a while before he joins in her song to announce himself like a fucking creep. She doesn't trust him afterwards, which makes total sense, and keeps him at bay with a knife. Totally understand why. So this is the uh, first time that we uh, get a Bond girl coming out of the water. We're gonna we're gonna get this over and over and over and all of up and I think all the way down to Holly Berry. Holly Berry is gonna completely, almost completely redo this to the point of where her bathing suit was meant to look like it. Yeah, yeah, like that far. I mean, like Bond girls coming out of the water, that's a thing until Daniel Craig. And then you got Bond coming out. And of then the you water. have Bond coming out of the water, right? Her name is Honey Ryder. This is our first like. I mean, Sylvia Trench is our first Bond girl. This is our first, like, Bond, Bond girl. Like, the girl that he ends up with in the movie. Yeah, the the girl that has the crazy name, because they all have crazy names. But that being said, Sylvia Trench is still with him in the next movie. Where's Honey Ryder? All right, fuck off. Yeah. And she's here collecting shells for money. Bond laughs at her name, which I thought was like, maybe that was a funnier joke 60 years ago. I don't know. Well, it's a little dirty 60 years ago, Honey Ryder. I guess. Maybe it was funnier 60 years ago. A patrol boat comes out looking for the intruders after seeing Honey's boat approach on radar because she didn't put down her sail, like they did. And they all hide behind the sand berm. How many rounds do you think that patrol boat put into the sand before they just drove off? I don't know, man, because they demand that the intruders come out, but they don't know exactly where they are. So they just blind fire into the sand and say, all right, we're going to go get the dogs. It was all just this bluff. Yeah. This henchman sounds so lazy and unenthused about his job. He was like, damn it, they're making us go get the dogs. Why don't they come out so I can just shoot them and get back to my supper? It's, I mean, why don't you just get off the boat and go walk the beach? You're not that far. (laughs) We see, we we, we know you're here. We see it. What's up? (laughs) 
Just, we just don't know where. There's some laziness in this movie that's just unexplicable. I, there, there really is. The, uh, on all sides, from James Bond to the bad guys to the villains, it's just some complete and total laziness. Honey and Bond debate the existence of dragons by Bond saying, don't be daft, and Honey saying weird shit like, have you ever seen sea beams glittering at Tannhauser Gate? Ever see a mantis do the Macarena? I have. <laughs> and and Quar Quarrel's like, she's right. <laughs> That's not exactly what she said, but just as ridiculous. It's pretty <laughs> much. Do you like my Blade Runner reference? Yes, I did like your Blade Runner reference, yes. Bond tries to send her away, but her boat was shot up, so she has to tag along, I guess. She even blames him and gets him to promise her a new boat back at Kingston. Bitch, it's your fault. He avoided the radar. Yeah, yeah, that's true. The guards are back as we trek through the jungle on this island, and this time they did bring the doggos. The trio try to hide under water breathing reeds, but the dogs are closing in. And it looks like they will be found, because dogs can still smell your scent through water. Ask the Mythbusters. I'm right? serious. Yes. But at the last moment, a flock of birds take off, and the guards say, well, there's no other reason for birds flying except people, and, <laughs> and they leave, even though scent dogs weren't even thinking about that direction. Right. I don't know. Again, lazy. It's stupid. But Keith the guard was tying his shoes, you know, so he was catching up after everyone left, and since he was alone, it meant Bond needed to kill him. So he sneaks up in the water and stabs him in the back, and Honey asks him why, and he says, I had to. <laughs> And here's the thing about that. He didn't really. Odds are no. he was just going to walk right by him and not notice. <laughs> no, I know. I was like, nah, dude, you wanted to and you knew you could get away with it. No wonder she doesn't come back for the sequel. Yeah, yeah. I had to kill him. Her reaction was a little over the top, too. It was like, her, her reaction was a little over the top, even for murder. But we're talking about a young <laughs> Ursula Andrews here. She was supposed to be naive and beautiful so i guess i thought she read encyclopedias she knew more than him oh yeah Fucking bitch they find dragon tracks uh but they kind of look suspiciously like taint tread tracks that's weird they stop to rest on their bombs and exposit i mean get to know each other <laughs> honey reveals that she thinks dr no kills her dad for literally no reason by the way she just doesn't believe that he could ever drown that's the only explanation we're given for any kind of connection to that Right. Well, her dad came out to the island to collect shells as well, but... Fair enough. I mean, he probably did kill her dad, but she doesn't have a solid enough reason. Yeah. She doesn't have any other evidence than her father drowned and he was an accomplished swimmer. Like, accomplished swimmers drown. He can never drown. Yeah, it's impossible. He had a cheat code. <laughs> <laughs> she says she grew up traveling and educated herself with the encyclopedia, and then Wicked Girl claims to know more than Bond. She admits to being raped by and then killing a dude and the time in between these subjects in this conversation by the way is almost non-existent yeah right? and no and no segue no segue. With little to no segue no, no. it was a it was an interesting conversation to say the least a lot of character she, building she bragged about it taking a week for him to die from a black widow spider fight and then she just looks at bond and coyly asks if she did anything wrong and he just kind of like looks like oh fuck i guess well don't make a habit of it well here's the thing he just stabbed a man. Not, what, 15 minutes prior? That man had a gun. That man was armed. She put a Black Widow so, spider oh, in there's it. There's something dude. else I wanted to point out, too, which was a really good point of storytelling. Is after Bond and everybody was submerged in the water and they're having this long tete-a-tete, -tete, he was cleaning and drying his gun and bullets the whole entire time. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, because I had written in my notes, is like, how long is this gun underwater? And then they spend a whole scene cleaning it. And I was like, oh, that's actually. Oh my good. god! You just gave a reason for this scene to exist. Fuck you. <laughs> I well, I'm sorry, but that's what happened. <laughs> you son of a bitch. You son of a bitch. After all this weird talk, she immediately asks if he has a woman of his own, and he hesitates to answer. And he looks really cautious. And dude, I understand why. Well, she just admitted to poisoning a guy with a black widow spider. Well, he slept, yeah. Yeah. Again, with the spider assassination Again tool. with the spider, yeah. That's a thing. Uh, apparently. Quarrel, Quarrel saves the day, like the great wingman he is, and jumps in before he has to answer about the woman. He says, dragon's coming, and points. And then Bond grabs his gun and is like, good, I want to see it. So they run out of frame. They run out of frame, and then they cut to them slowly walking through the lagoon for a while again. And then they cut again, and it's dark now, instantly, for some reason. And now they're in a field with a tank in the middle of it, and a loudspeaker is like, 
Stay where you are. And Flamethrower shoots flames from the front of the tank, which has been poorly painted with the mouth to look like a dragon. Now, seeing the dragon runs on diesel, Bond tells Korok to take the driver and Bond will get the lights. They take cover behind a fucking bush, which isn't going to provide much cover. And don't tell me it was to hide them because the slow ass tank went right to Quarrel and roasted him. Yeah, <laughs> it sure did. Yeah, uh, Bush isn't much cover against flamethrower kids, just so you know. Oh yeah, by the way, rip Quarrel. They waste bullets for a minute. Like Bond, like finally hits a headlight, which does literally nothing to save Quarrel, by the way. Rip a real one, this rum's for you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Honey runs up next to Bond like, I'm scared. And it's like, well, then fucking stay back where you were then, stupid. Yeah. After they torch Coral, they pop out of the tank in radiation suits and machine guns. They take Bond and Honey and honestly, why do they have to shoot at Bond's feet and then physically incapacitate him? It's like beyond me. It's like, dude, you're unarmed. You're surrounded. You're in the middle of the field by people with machine guns and in suits that tells me maybe I shouldn't even be on this island. Can you just not not fight for a moment? Right. Yeah. Well, not James Bond, no. He's going to fight everybody he comes across. He's like Russell Crowe punching across the world. Well, they were making it look like he was desperate not to get caught. But if he was desperate not to get caught, then why is he not as nonchalant as he is in the next few scenes? I don't know. It doesn't work as well. No, it does not. That he, f that he fought when he did there. They're taken back to the base, and they're stripped and decontaminated through a showering system. Honey goes full frontal. But through the power of modern television, you can see she's wearing a skin-covered leotard. Sorry, guys. Yeah, no naked Ursula Andrews, and I was checking. Yeah, I slowed that down. I got a TV that, like, it, it interpolates, it adds frames. So how about that upscales. shower where they spray them with foam and then they scrub the brush on their back once? <laughs> scrub, scrub. Listen, like, it's and good. Just on the back, right? It's more than I scrub my back. And then... And then and then they make them take all their clothes off. So, like, what the fuck was the foam for? Then they run them through a washing machine, and I guess. They get a washing. You know, <laughs> they, they're sterile afterwards. You, you, run, you run them through this thing for five seconds and all the radiation is gone. That's how that works. Don't you know science? That's how that works. Exactly how that works. They're given blue robes and a cigarette and they're shown to their rooms. The woman showing them their rooms is like full hotel train concierge type. She even shows them a closet saying that she hopes the clothes fit because they just got their sizes last night. As in, they knew they'd be there, both of them. Which makes sense for Bond. Yes. You know? But not right, but, Honey. But and not like, Honey. Like, how like, the fuck did they know she was going to be there? Did Honey just come, like, every Sunday or something? Like, every other Sunday and they knew she was coming? I, I don't know. I, like, I, I don't know. Maybe it was that whole day-night segue with the tank thing. Maybe, you know, they found out they were there at night, and then by the time they get back to the base, it's daytime. The dragon's coming two days later. Like, I don't know. I, I never got... I, I didn't understand that either. I like how Bond gave him the one-liner. It's when she's like, can, can, can we get you anything else? He's like, how about two tickets to London? Oh, yeah. No, I was about to say that. It's a power play, and Connery played it to where Bond noticed that, too. The way he looked at her when she said about the sizes and last night, like, he, he looked up like, oh, yeah. And the woman goes to leave, saying if there's anything you need to ask. And yeah, Bond says, two tickets, uh, two air tickets to London. I love that line. I'm glad you noticed it. Yeah, yeah, it's a good line. They drink the tea left for them because they're just as stupid as Qui-Gon Jinn. Like, so you don't I, need I, to gas the room, poison the tea. <laughs> again, with the spycraft stuff, you know you're being incarcerated. Why, Why did you, you drink, drink that? <laughs> anything they gave you? He was like, oh, i got to play a cool because they probably bugged and listening to us. Yeah, but right. so let me drink this drink. <laughs> right, uh, but I'm hungry. I'm going to eat this food and drink this drink. Like, uh... Obviously, they're drugged. They lose consciousness. Bond is angry with this rookie mistake and trashes the cup and saucer and even the serving table on his way out cold. <laughs> angry he with does. stupidness? Yeah, I suppose. Mm -hmm. While they're out, someone put them in their beds and tucked them in. You'd think it was Dr. No, but then there's a fucking creepy scene of him coming in and slowly approaching the bed and just rubbing his black metal hand over Bond and removing the covers. It's so gross, guy. It, it is kind of creepy. And that guy does not look Chinese at all. But really, the idea was Bond was vulnerable and this guy could have done anything with him. Like, you know, and, it, and it's also kind of cool to notice the homoerotic nuances of some of the Bond characters this early on, even. Oh, yeah. It's something we rarely see, but it does appear enough to be its own thing. It does appear to be. I, I mean, Blofeld was like his Joker. Like, you complete me. <laughs> <laughs> they get dressed in Oriental clothing and head down for dinner with their host. Honey makes a comment about his hands, about Bond's hands being too sweaty, and he says, "Of course, I'm scared." 
They embrace in the elevator. And honestly, I don't think Bond will ever again be portrayed so vulnerably as this. Craig got love hurt, but he still played it to... He, he played his character to where his outside wouldn't let it show. Yeah. Con- Connery's letting it show here. Yeah, yeah. They, they might... I mean, because there's a couple of movies where that vulnerability comes through again. Maybe the last 60 seconds of OHMS. Um... Uh, the last scene when when is that the one know. where he got married? That's not yeah, the one where yeah, he got yeah, married. Yeah, 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 Spoilers, spoilers. Well, <laughs> sorry. That's like that's like a few weeks from now. Yeah. Doctor No's living room or in lair apartment, I don't know, is another impeccable Ken Adams set. There is a very bad blue screen fish tank with some normal like minnows just stretched all to hell to look like giants, and it's incredibly laughable. Yes. One million dollars, a voice brags, and we finally see the face of the titular Dr. No as played by Joseph Wiseman, smiling like a pompous buffoon. He's like, that's what you were thinking, Mr. Bond. But I guess to be fair, Bond says, yeah, he was thinking that, so fuck it. (laughs) Dr. No points out his metal hands and says it's from his radioactive work. He gives them their favorite drinks that he knows offhand, just like their sizes. Bond, like, rightly, like, you see him sniffing his drink because he was drugged from the last one. Well, yeah, right? As they move to the supper table, Bond notices a painting of a British officer. Now, this is really interesting. This is something I, in my research I found. This painting was added at the 11th hour when the actual version of this painting had been recently nicked from a museum in England in broad daylight. Yes, that's right. The famous painting. Yes. Yeah. It was hot news on the island in real life at the time. So it was like a tongue-in-cheek way to make your bad guy look like a more cultured, more badass all at the same time. Right, right. I had this painting stolen. Ha ha. Yeah, ha ha. I was the one. Then he has uh then he has the now trope like speech of I'm a white man playing an unwanted child of a German missionary and a poor Chinese farm girl, but now I have everything. I smoke cigars in my lair with giant minnows. I'm awesome. Even with shiny black metal hands, I'm still awesome. Speaking of which, Dr. No reveals he that he stole ten million dollars worth of gold bars from the Chinese and Bond's like, Oh, so you use that to start up this with the radiation, huh? Well good to see you can handle it ha 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 ha. i didn't like that one that one was bad like out of all of them i like that one that one was an arnold schwarzenegger one-liner so that was an arnold schwarzenegger (laughs) one-liner but i was born in 1985 so i loved it right 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 also you you know he points out that he's a member of specter now and Mm -hmm. yeah that's in a minute yeah 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 and then he dropped that specter is an acronym which i totally forgot Mm-hmm. I got that on here. Bond also bluffs that he's reported most of this new info already. And Dr. No calls him on his bluff, like straight up, like you're full of shit, bro, and tells him why. He also threatens to destroy England when he's done playing with rockets. Like, god damn, that was okay. Why are you, what are you getting out of these rockets? Right? Bond is like, get rid of the girl. This is between us. You know, she won't talk. And she goes, yes, I will. I want to stay with you. <laughs> yeah. I will talk. I want to stay with you. Well, I don't I want you here. Okay, listen, hot take. And this is going to happen a lot with us because we're not going to agree with the mainstream. Okay, I know everyone is like, oh, she's the first Bond girl. She's also the Andrews. She... But so far, she's also the dumbest Bond girl. Uh, so <laughs> far. So far, she is the, the epitome of, of what we used to call a dumb blonde back in the day. Out of, out of two, yes, yeah, she really is. And she's playing it like that. So don't even, br- don't even bust our balls. Right. You know, it's super madman, and you get a little rape threat from the doc, good doctor, because he's like, oh, I'm sure my guards will entertain her. I'm like, holy shit, that was a rape threat. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was fucked up. Yeah. Bond grabs a champagne. That's actually what causes this. Bond gets mad. He grabs a champagne bottle, and he goes to break it. He's not going for Dr. No. He's going for that guard that's going off with her. Yeah. Dr. No informs him it's a 1955 Dom Perignon, and Bond's like, oh, shit. My bad, and puts it down before quipping he'd prefer a 53 himself. Really, Bond had a gun at his back by this time, but right. like, you know, it was a cool line. You know, it'd be like, oh, no sweat. You know, I'm doing it for that reason, not because you told me. Right. <laughs> Dr. No also tells him to put his table knife back, which Bond tried to surreptitiously take during the scuffle. Bond tries to pry into the missile toppling for No to reveal that he's just a first stage boss and Bond must get all the gym badges to challenge the final big bad of some group with a very silly name called Spectre. And I wonder if we'll ever even see these guys again, the special executive for counterintelligence, terrorism, revenge, and extortion. The four great cornerstones of power headed by the greatest brains in the world, criminal brains. 
Ah, but criminal brains are superior. They have to be. Yeah, that's why they always get caught. But, you know, whatever. It's As I was about to say in my notes, I wrote, that makes no sense. Both sides are always trying to outsmart and outmaneuver the other. There's brilliant generals and duds on both sides always. Always. Dr. No reveals that he joined Spectre and is toppling rockets because the West denied his job application. And the East did too, so fuck them all. <laughs> that's what he said. That's what he said. Basically, you're not, Bonds, yeah, you're not wrong. He's doing it. And when he's done, he might go nuke England. <laughs> it was revenge because he felt like he was being ostracized. It's really kind of cool, by the way. I want to throw this in. The whole time he's saying to Bond, you know, the only reason you're not dead already and we're having this conversation is because, like, I think that you can, you, you know, you, you get this and, and you can get me and, and you can join in on this. And he's like, I, I could get you in on Spectre. And he's like, yeah, Bond's like, yeah, I would go in for revenge and go after the dude who killed Strangways and his secretary in Quarrel. You're right. He's like, basically like, fuck you, dude. Ba yeah, basically. So far in this movie, James Bond is the epitome of cool when it's necessary. And the epitome of vulnerable for that era when it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a good mix. It's a, it's a really good I could see why it launched a successful 25 movie series. Yeah. Yeah. 60 years later, we're still talking about it. Here you go. Here you go. Bond says he has a Napoleon complex for some reason, even though that makes no sense. And then he says he has a God complex, wanting to dominate the world, even though this guy just admitted he's a level one underboss. Yeah, but he did really say he wanted to take over the world, basically. Not really. We don't even know why he's toppling rockets. He's just pissed that his job applications were turned down. Yeah, I know. That's one of the things I want to talk about if we ever got to the plot, overall plot of this movie. It's like, this plot of this movie didn't really pan out until the last 20 minutes. Of, mm -hmm. of this movie and even then it's still not like what are you doing and why <laughs> as an aside as an aside by the way two things here uh one him revealing everything and not immediately shooting bond you know like melting his dna with radiation or something right like, it was was that he respected bond by knowing him well enough to believe he'd understand appreciate and approve of what dr no was doing down here instead of being a sick dog for the queen you're an idiot. You know Bond that well, huh? You don't know Bond at all. I guess he doesn't know everything, I wrote in my notes. No, yeah, he doesn't know everything. Bond is pretty loyal to the Queen, at the very least of everything. It just gave a reason for the conversation. At least they gave a reason for the conversation instead of not killing, instead of like, why are they having this conversation? Why didn't you just kill them? At least there's a reason given here. Right, yeah. Bef before it's just done. Yeah. Secondly, the Spectre mention was brilliant in 1962. Nowadays, we don't think about this stuff, but back then, to say this was so badass. It's, it's just a taste. This bad guy is, is nothing. Like, we haven't even revealed the big threat, and we're doing it with a group of villains, and it was such a brilliant franchise-wise move, I, I feel like, that is probably a huge reason why the series was able to keep going so well to the point it is today. Well, a lot of this was on the shoulders of our man Ian. Um... Mr. Fleming. Yeah, he established all of this long before the movies came out, so... Thank you, Ian. They both threaten each other a little bit, and the scenes end with, you know, Dr. No saying, hey, soften him up a bit. I, I'm not finished with him yet. And it's like, fucking why? Now at this point, you kill him. There's no reason not to. Right. But we fade to black, and again, we wake up with Bond. Do you <laughs> but this a time... lot of the violence is kind of off-screen for... Yes. Oh, yeah, because, well, they, they track Dr. No as he walks away, so you don't see, you just, you, you see them like, oh, is he getting punched? I don't know. It's, but you can hear it, but, screen. yeah, you don't really see it until. Well, it's the same way with the stabbing of the dude in the lagoon. Not only is the knife underwater during that and behind his back, but Sean Connery almost never pulls the, the knife out of the water again after that. Right. It's just for a second at that very end of the scene. I watched forever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, a lot of the violence is obscured in this movie. When he wakes up, he's in a small metal cell, and it looks really bloody hot because everything is fucking metal. One of the walls actually even leans in on you two, and the vent is electrified, and since the entire cell is metal, I have questions, but moving on. You're right! I had <laughs> questions, too. At, at, but, used... but moving on, Bond escapes with his shoe. He uses his shoe to punch out this electrified gate Which and somehow I laughed the metal frame. so hard about... Because all I could think of was get smart. 
Because all of Get Smart's gadgets were in his shoe. Were in his shoe. Maxwell Smart. The metal frame is, even though it's complete metal and like it's somehow no longer carrying a charge, even though it's had to be what was electrifying the grate. Right. So Bond diehards, you know, his way through the vents until he falls down this shaft that he's shimmying. The heat is rising. He makes his way through. He takes off his jacket to make covers for his hands. Well, yeah, that's a... because the tunnel got hot enough for him to burn mm-hmm. his hands, but burn his he hands. didn't notice that until his hands were burning. I can't... Well, he just waited until he couldn't take it anymore. I, I understand that. Well, okay, maybe he waited till he couldn't take it anymore. But then, then the tunnel fills with water. Well, he takes his jacket off to make those covers for his hands, and the shirt underneath is pre-ripped and bloodied for no reason underneath the jacket, you know? No, that's the shirt he was... Uh... Uh, beaten up in. Uh, that's fair. But how come his outer jacket was fine? The dinner jacket was fine. The shirt underneath was all ripped up. That doesn't that, make sense. That's, well, he didn't change his shirt. That's all I could think of. It's like he's still wearing... Back fair. then, people wore t-shirts, right? He was still wearing his t-shirt. It's literally the Kirk fight treatment. Just ripped the shirt a little bit. Yeah, literally. The vents are then flooded with water, which I hope was being fed to the radioactive source and not from it <laughs> otherwise you know like we're, we're not going to talk about it. the science of the radiation of this place because <laughs> oh yes we will the vent is now a sauna james just lost 10 pounds by the way well i think it's worse than that i mean if it was hot enough for him to make covers to burn his hands well the whole thing is just steaming even as, even as connery actually is walking through this thing it's like that is a sauna once you know your clothes are wet they don't make good insulate. I mean, water is a horrible insulator. <laughs> so I'm just confused at like how all of this was. Anyway, we're not going to talk about the no. special effects anymore. No. I'm no. done. Out of out of the vents, he jumps a poor tech who's just collecting a paycheck and takes his suit. Another Bond spot in- of obscured violence. Bond, in- yeah, it is behind an opaque like wall barrier. Yes, thing. it is separator divider. Bond enters the villain layer where the magic happens. On the screens, our Americans are prepping to launch a rocket where the bad guys are here prepping to topple it. And now, Bond, mistaken for Chang, the poor wait, guy who wait. just shrank. Wait, before we get to Chang, can I just point out how this was the best labeled lab I've ever seen in my life? <laughs> I mean, this lab looked like a lab. I don't know. Out Adam's of West, Sesame Adam Street. Adam West Batcave? Um, Adam West Batcave is probably right there. It, it looked like a ba- Adam West Batcave. That's how well labeled this lab was. Bat reactor. <laughs> right? Mistaken for Chang, the poor guy that he strangled and is now ruining the reputation of by being a bad worker, Bond is sent to a workstation. Okay, here's the thing. Noah is using this reactor as a power source for whatever is toppling shit for whatever reason. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll, I, I got you. Right. Fine. But why is the room that they do all their toppling ops in in the very same room that they house their reactor? I couldn't tell you that. And no, why did why do we go? Why are we going to do our business in the no reactor? No physicist would have built it that way. <laughs> even even the Soviets are laughing at the insane lack of safety or sense here. Oh my God! There is no safety or sense in this lab. It's well labeled, but it's not a good it's lab. Well labeled. <laughs> How you are going to die is well labeled. Yeah. Yes, uh, I and I wanted to point out a little bit of the the uh, sound engineering that they did in this scene. The the noises. Yeah, because back then it had the Sputnik sound in it. If you didn't recognize mm-hmm. that, dee 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 dee, that is the sound that Sputnik spread across the globe when it, it went up. Cool. I guess it was as the most high tech sound that anybody had heard at the time. So <laughs> there you go. Fair enough. Hey, future retro. Future retro. So to commence toppling or whatever, they have to turn off the reactor for some reason by lowering it in a pool and get the radiation to zero in the room in a few seconds. What? It, again, physics. Anyway. Okay, no, that's not how any of that works. But yeah. since that's how that works, <laughs> Bond just has to raise the reactor out of the pool in time for gym class, and that should fuck up Noah's machines and create some kind of nice, crowd-pleasing splody splodies. Um. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I don't want to say it's the typical sci-fi superhero in a lab trope but they turned it all the way up and it explodes now i don't know who keeps building this shit but it put a it limiter seems that you would have some sort of safety feature to prevent <laughs> turning it all the way up till it explodes i mean it happens if- all the time well in tests every time we cranked it to 11 it exploded well 
make the dial stop at 10. Yeah. <laughs> like, why is that a feature? Like, the most recent one I can think of is Captain America, the, the first Captain America movie. I don't know if we got enough power. We'll turn it all the way up. And then it blows up. They don't test their designs, okay? It's a trope. And it's not a good one. I love how sus Bond is acting this whole time he's in there, but in this room, just like waiting to turn that right? crank to, just like looking around. He's not even <laughs> in the right spot. He's never in the right spot. He's just looking around. He's acting weird. He's acting like he's waiting for no one to look at him so he can do something. It's like, how does no one notice how weird Chang is acting right now? Right? Nobody notices Chang just picked up a file. Like, when he picked up the file, when he walked into the room, I'm like, did that guy did not notice he just, this guy just came by and picked up his file? Like, I would have said, you're like, hey, it's my paperwork. Where are you going with that? <laughs> Bond says fuck it and just turns for his life on that crank. He's like raising the reactor and then he gets jumped by the only dude in a fully see through suit. Now, this is important. Most people have a suit in this scene that only displays the eyes and they're extras. And this is also so Bond can be Chang. You only see his eyes. Right. Now, Dr. No has a suit with a transparent head because he's on the bill, goddammit. Right. He's Dr. No. This, he's the boss. Everybody yeah, needs to see this him. This guy has a clear suit, head to toe, so you can see how muscular for his era that he is. This guy is the muscle, I, I think, anyway. They fight. Briefly. 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 Bond punches him off of a landing like nine feet onto the ground, so I think that means he's dead. Can we point out how this dude was dressed like a Harkonnen from the 1984 Dune? Like, <laughs> I thought he, I thought he was about to join Popeye the Sailor Man. <laughs> they had his suit inflated with a hose. It's just, <laughs> yeah, I, I, no, dude, I had to think to myself like... back in the '60s, you know how loud it was in that fucking suit because he was just pumping a vacuum cleaner. All, reverse. all of the radiation suits were blown up, like in their head, like those suits were inflated or something. It was so stupid. Yeah, uh, yes, it was definitely weird. So Bond's raised the reactor, everything's going to shit, and in, a, and in, in this sign flashes, you're, you're gloriously, la everything's labeled abandoned area sign. <laughs> love it. I love it. I just, like, if you're going to build a machine that can explode if you crank it too high, you need to have that you sign. You need to have an abandoned area sign, of course. Everyone escapes, and I'm just happy to see that, you know, Dr. No actually complies with OSHA standards in his lair. I'm letting the boys at Hinch Union know he's a good man. <laughs> He is a good man. He, he is complying to some sort of safety standards, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Of course, Dr. No, instead of escaping, runs immediately like a ninny, by the way, to Bond and starts slapping him with his shiny hands. So I want to talk about this fight scene for a hot minute. Go for it. This is probably the worst Bond fight scene I've ever seen. <laughs> this, this has got to be like Austin Powers bad. It was it a horrible worst. fight scene. Uh, and the no, death of no, Dr. No was weak at best. No runs like literally like a sissy and goes up and just starts eh, eh, slapping. It, it was, they somehow instantly and un unexplainably end up on the reactor platform as it lowers into the water. And I'm sorry, but suits or not, they're both dead that close to that water. I'm sorry. Um, what, yeah, but the way physics works, yeah. What the fuck? What the Bond fuck? They're standing on top of the cooling unit of a nuclear reactor. <laughs> I mean, in the water. No, they're standing on top of the nuclear reactor as it lowers into the water. Right. So Bond climbs out and leaves No to dissolve in the water with a good, you know, like, uh, kick to the face. The uh, unstable place continues to self-destruct and the American rocket makes it to space untoppled. Bond, meanwhile, runs around looking for honey. He forcefully stops a guy for information. This guy was just trying to get out. He was going to, like... He forcefully stopped two people. If he was going to force this guy to stop his e-back for this, he could have just grabbed him. But Bond, being the dick he is in this movie, trips the tech trying to flee for his <laughs> life, then punches the man out for his trouble. Like, right? Because he didn't know. <laughs> like, what a like, dick. Like, 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 now he'll die here in a few moments. Right. Jesus. Right? And how about the elaborate death trap they set up for Honey Rider? Like... That was the the only protracted Bond death doesn't even go to him. It goes to her. See, he gets to Honey. He punches out another dude to die, but at least this one's an armed guard. Honey is the only one who's really in a protracted murder attempt here. She is restrained to a slanted floor with what I can only assume was either rising tide water or radioactive water. And if it's the latter, she's dead. No worries. You won. Yeah, yeah. Her feet are in it. That's good. We're done. <laughs> yeah, because she's dead. <laughs> How long has she been in there? Oh, yeah, she's good. 
out on the deck of this old rusty rig, which we immediately cut to, and with it supposedly held the lair, a bunch of Caribbean people are suddenly evacuating like there's no tomorrow. Suddenly there's no Asian or any radiation suits. It's so odd. It's Just- really weird how how suddenly the entire crew turned black. There's just a lot of Islander extras for some reason. Just people running and diving off the platform. And by diving, I mean two dudes gracefully and in fully leap. Yes. Off hands extended in the most old-fashioned, beautiful way to perfectly belly flop into the ocean. Yes. Bravo. Bond and Honey jump off in a convenient boat and again punch the two people on the boat off to be left for dead when the place blows <laughs> up literally three seconds later. Literally count it. Right. Where is their humanity? It's like. Swim fast, like, just... The boat could have easily held all of them. <laughs> right? Why did he knock out a dude to die? The place blows. They run out of fuel in what could be classic Bond style and what will be classic Bond style. They drift in the boat, waiting untold time for rescue. Meanwhile, shenanigans. Shenanigans with Ursula Andrews. It is your cheesy, typical Bond ending. Even when Felix shows up to rescue, and I'm doing air quotes, when Felix shows up to (laughs) rescue them, Bond takes the rope and just (laughs) lets it go. Because, you know, he's going to have his moment with his girl. They they throw him the line, and he ties it to the boat, so they're towing the boat back, and she lowers down. I I thought, I thought. And it, it, no, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, You saw that too? (laughs) It 100% looks like she's going to give him a head, but they cut to Felix. Yes. Looking back like, oh, shit, there he goes yeah, and then, again. Yeah, then they cut back and Bond and her on the same and level. They cut like, back oh, and Bond is God. already down and he's releasing the rope and the boat goes back. And I guess Felix is like, yeah, don't worry, we'll go get a coffee and come back, asshole. Are we going to talk about the way that the nuclear reactor on the island exploded? <laughs> it's just it's in... off the coast of Jamaica. I, like, fuck I the, just want to bring that up. It was a Chernobyl level explosion of a nuclear reactor. Off the coast Kingston. of Jamaica. Kingston is lit. This is Fukushima. The, rah, in, in the Caribbean. In the Caribbean. I mean, like, if that had really happened, we wouldn't be able to live there until now. <laughs> Maybe even not now. Maybe even not now. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great movie. It does not end with Bond will be back because they weren't that cocky yet, unlike some people making movies. Right. No, it was a, it was a one and done kind of thing because, you know, sequels weren't a huge thing in the 60s. Just to wrap this up, to move on for a couple things, some international locations, which is a big Bond trope, set in London, Jamaica, and Crab Key, a fictional island off of Jamaica. Filming began on location at the Palisades Airport in Kingston, Jamaica, on the 16th of January, 1962, which is about 10 months before its release. Nice. The primary scenes were the exterior shots of Crab Key and Kingston, where an uncredited Sid Kane acted as art director and also designed the Dragon Tank. Oh, nice. And, Good job, Sid. Yeah, and, I know, dude. Interesting to note that the shooting took place a few yards from Fleming's Goldeneye Estate. Almost all of it took place right in his backyard. Real cheap. Real cheap. And the, yep. and the author actually regularly visited the filming set with friends. Like, hey, they're making my movie. Of course he did. He was a huge fan. <laughs> he was trying to get it made for like, ever. Forever, yeah. Lo- location filming was largely in Arakabesa with additional scenes on the Palisade Strip and Port Royal in St. Andrew. Now, on the 21st of February, production left Jamaica with footage still unfilmed due to a change of weather. So five days later, filming began at Pinewood Studios in Buckinghamshire, England, with sets designed by the legendary Ken Adam, which included Dr. No's base, the ventilation Dr. Bond tries to escape through, and the interior of the British Secret Service headquarters, which has not yet been referred to as MI6. The Pinewood Studio would be used in a majority of later Bond films. Adam's budget for the entirety of the film was about £20,000. And after about 58 days of filming, the principal photography was completed on, on March 30, uh, 1962, by the way. Yeah, oh, nice. Now, this is a little more six months before release, when principal photography was completed. And I don't know if you heard me about that, by the way. Adams, those sets, he made those with like about 20,000 pounds. Yeah, yeah. No, I heard you. That was fantastic. He did an awesome job. It's like, well, 20,000 pounds of 60s money is probably a lot of money. It's probably... No, I, I, I looked it up. It still amazed me that the, he made what... This guy is a master. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. makes amazing sets, and you don't have to give him much to do it. No, no, no. The kill count. How many do you think Bond killed? Um, Bond killed seven people. Four. Only four? Four. On the official kill count, Bond killed Dent with a gun. Yep. The Lagoon Guard with a hidden knife. He 
strangled Chang. Chang has been counted as strangled yeah. officially. And Dr. No was kicked and lowered into radioactive water. What about there the driver? Other, there were eight other deaths. What driver? The driver killed himself. There oh, eight other right. deaths. The driver killed him. Shrangways, his secretary, Mr. Jones, yeah. the driver, three blind mice, and their driver, and Quarrel. Yeah, I'm going to blame Bond for killing uh, everybody. Because it's all basically Especially his fault. Especially Quarrel. Especially Quarrel. Because Quarrel was like, I don't want to go back there, fucking white man. Yeah, yeah. Twelve deaths in this movie. Twelve. Well, wow, man, they ramped that up. That's actually kind of a lot of deaths for a 1962 movie, I feel like. Yeah, well, Maybe this movie me. was ultra-violent for the day. <laughs> yeah. For the stunts, the editor wanted to use quick cuts and employed fast motion and exaggerated sound effects on the action scenes. Oh, he did that. Peter Peter Hunt, our editor from earlier with the funny name, said his intention was to move fast and push it along the whole time while giving it a certain style. And the undercranking for me just kind of, it sucked. When Bond would flip him and he suddenly went really, really fast on the flip, yeah. I just didn't like that Yeah, shit. I didn't like it either. He added uh, that the fast pacing would help audiences not notice any writing problems. <laughs> It did. Okay, Peter. It didn't. <laughs> Sorry, it didn't. Peter. It didn't help. It didn't help. Simmons, who is uncredited for the film, the stuntman Simmons, described, by the way, doing um, the tarantula scene yeah. as the most frightening stunt he'd ever performed. Is he afraid of spiders, too? I don't know. In line uh, with the book, the scene was to feature honey tied to the ground and left to be attacked by crabs. But... The crabs were actually sent frozen from the Caribbean, and they moved very little during filming, so the scene was altered to have her slowly drowning. I guess that's what was happening. The stunts are very early 60s. I mean, opening gunman and stuntman. What is uh, up with all of the animal death tools? Like, crabs? Really? Who wrote that? 20 minutes earlier. Our man Ian. Laugh out loud. Well, if it's got six or eight legs, we want it. I suppose. Opening gunman and stuntman Bob Simmons also served as the film's fight choreographer, employing a rough fighting style. Stiff, slow, telegraphed choreography that was obviously undercranked, yeah. Yeah. Any of these action sequences wouldn't even garner enough attention to be laughed at. No. But for the time, but for the time this was actually very exciting stuff. It was. Very kind of cutting edge back in the day. The score. Monty Norman was invited to write the film score because Broccoli liked his work on the 1961 theater production Bell. Norman was busy with musicals and only agreed to do the music for Dr. No after Saltzman allowed him to travel along with the crew to Jamaica and also let his wife sing Mango Tree. <laughs> Which is good. Other notable, so yeah, other notable songs in the film are the song Jump Up, played in the background uh, during the um, tiki scene. Right. Byron Lee and the Dragonaires appeared in the film and performed some of the music on the later soundtrack album. Lee and the other Jamaican musicians who appear in the soundtrack were the ones playing this. They actually were right. the band playing right. it in, in, the, that in, scene. The, in the scene. Yeah. Other musicians appearing on the soundtrack included Ernest, Ernest Ringland and Carlos Malcolm. And the reason I wrote this down is they sued Eon for unpaid fees and both settled out of court. Oh, nice. Good for them. Don't let so movie more studios just use your music. And, you know, when all this is over, I, when we're done with all of it, I want to rank the Bonds, the M's, the Money Pennies, the Q's, the Villains. Sure. You know? But right now, for right now, I just want to rank two things. Okay. For the first episode, the answer is going to be really, really easy because there's only one movie right. on the list. Right. So, where do you put this title song? I guess I put it at Space One because that's the only space right now um i'm gonna put this title song at seven <laughs> he's preemptively just guessing I'm, i am i am preemptively guessing it may move up it may move down it may move down but yeah. right now it's at seven of, of course with nothing to compare it to yeah i had uh, zero to compare it to rankings. but i'm not gonna say it was the worst i'm not gonna say but it's we'll the best see. But we'll see uh, when more movies come on as we fill up the list at the end of this episode as some go up and down and push others up and down as well. Like something maybe, you know, uh, for the first three movies we've watched our favorite movie and maybe by the 15th it's not. You right. Know? That's how this is going to work. We'll do the title song. We'll do the movie. And when this is all over, we will rank Bonds. We will rank the M's. We will rank the Money Pennies, the Q's. And we even will rank the villains. For the villains, probably just pick our top five. Yeah, I, I would go with top five villains because there are a lot of villains. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a little bit more than the others to yeah. like rank. Yeah, yeah. But that's the concept of the show. You guys, I hope you enjoyed the first episode, and we will see you back next time for From Russia with Love. Oh, thank you guys for coming out.